Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining and hopefully participating in this conversation on ASEAN After 50, What's Next? My name is Tony Waterman. I work for Channel News Asia based in Singapore, and I'll be moderating this discussion this afternoon. I think that if you were to turn to the person on your left, there would probably be overwhelming consensus that ASEAN has accomplished heck of a lot over the past 50 years. There's been tens of millions of people that have been brought out of poverty. Economies have grown exponentially. ASEAN is a manufacturing hub of the world, and it's a destination for investment. I also think, though, that if you were to turn to the person on your right, that they would probably agree that a lot of challenges still remain. There is a lot of work to be done. There are pressures and challenges within ASEAN itself. There are things like infrastructure deficits, there's rising inequality, and there are also pressures coming from outside. What is the normalization of interest rates going to mean for investment and capital flows in this region? What about growing protectionism emanating from the West? And something that we should all be thinking about, what about climate change? This part of the world is going to be perhaps most susceptible to climate change. And then there is technology, which could force people or push people out of the labor force. We could see high unemployment, but it could also be the key to unlock ASEAN's next level of growth. And because technology is changing so quickly, there are challenges that we cannot even imagine at this point. So those are gonna be just some of the topics that we're gonna to touch upon over the next hour. And without further ado, please allow me to introduce our panel this afternoon. To my left is Nazir Razak. He's the chairman of CIMB Group Holdings. Sitting next to him is Dr. Tom Ping Jin, PJ. He's a research fellow at the University of Oxford in the UK, and he teaches the Southeast Asia program there. Sitting next to him is Manar Pimple. He's the senior director for global operations at Amnesty International. And sitting to his left is Mari Pandestu, the professor of international economics at the University of Indonesia, and of course, a former a trade minister. And last but by no means least, we have Salum Sai Komasith, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lao People's Democratic Republic. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. I think that when we have these big round numbers, 10, 20, 50, it's an invitation to look back and take stock of what has been accomplished and what we have learned. So perhaps we can start there and we can just go down the panel and talk about what you think the biggest lesson that we have learned in the past 50 years. How do we take that lesson, improve upon it, so that we're able to meet the challenges of the next 50 years? Nazir. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As I reflect uh, on the last 50 years, I think I would agree that ASEAN has uh, achieved a lot certainly in terms of peace, stability, and if you put it in the context of where we started. Um, I think um, what got us here, however, won't get us there. I think that's my, my, my main point. Uh, and I think what got us here has been the so-called ASEAN way of doing things. Um, and one of the key drivers uh, of the path, uh, uh, the future path, of course, uh, is uh, the economics. Uh, that ASEAN must deliver value to its people um, in terms of wealth creation, etc. And when you look at our achievements on the economic front, they're probably uh, much less uh, than there has been in the uh, uh, social political front. Um, and the ASEAN Economic Community, um, 2007, the 2007 Charter promised too much. Uh, they promised us a single production base uh, by 2015. <laughs> Uh, and we're well short of that single production base. <coughs> um, and uh, as we look forwards, however, um, you know, we can say that this ASEAN way got us here, so therefore let's continue with it. Or we can say the ASEAN way got us here, but the future terrain is really very, very different. Uh, so we have uh, to find a new way. Um, and I would go uh, with that argument. I would say that the fourth industrial revolution uh, is um, going to be very disruptive over the next 10, 20 years to all businesses. I think uh, it is imperative that we deliver economies of scale of ASEAN uh, to our companies, to our people. Uh, and for that, uh, we need a new ASEAN way uh, of doing things to accelerate uh, integration. PJ? 
Thank you, Tony, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think I want to make two points, and the first is that ASEAN actually has had the good fortune to exist during the time of the greatest economic expansion and the greatest creation of human wealth in all of human history. And how much of that is because of ASEAN and how much of that is because of broader circumstances uh, dealing with the end of World War II and new technology? That is a question that we need to ask. The second, I think, is to remember where ASEAN came from. Right? The history of ASEAN is very important. ASEAN was founded for one explicit purpose, and that fundamental purpose has not changed. ASEAN is, uh, was a strategy created by uh, regional elites to prop up their regimes against internal and external challenges, in particular against irredentist movements and left-wing nationalist movements. And that hasn't changed, and we need to understand integration and what ASEAN has achieved in that context. So ASEAN faced two major crises. The first was the end of the Cold War, and the second was the Asian financial crisis. And the end of the Cold War and the so-called end of history you know, and the triumph of liberal, liberal democracy led to this um, panic in uh, Southeast Asian capitals. You know, oh dear, we've chosen the wrong side of history. And so their response to that was Asian values and uh, its uh, successor, the ASEAN way. Now, um, this is actually uh, a strategy to retain control of the uh, dialogue, of the idea of values, to control, retain control of uh, societies, to uh, maintain stability for the regimes. But the even worse crisis was the Asian financial crisis, which really exposed the hollowness of regional governments' claims, pretensions to maintain regional stability. So the response to that was to embark on uh, these, uh, this reformist process, right, where they try to re-legitimize ASEAN, and in particular its economic claims, uh, through mock compliance with international norms and values, through uh, the imposition and the pursuit of uh, neoliberal integration. And so integration really needs to be seen in that context. And integration works for the elites. And the reason why economic integration, as opposed to political or social integration, has succeeded is because it helps perpetuate uh, the stability of elite regimes. Now, ASEAN faces a lot of challenges, but these challenges stem from the growing tension within ASEAN with this original goal of preserving its, uh, the, the stability of, of uh, the ASEAN states. Uh, for example, ASEAN says that we can um, solve regional crises in an ASEAN way. Uh, it says, you know, it, it, it complies with this, uh, it talks about human rights and democracy and the, the rhetoric of good governance. But in order to really effectively uh, uh, solve these issues, it needs to actually go beyond its current capabilities and actually uh, intervene in, in regional governments, in regional societies, in ways which are completely unacceptable to governments. And that's, I think, the central tension of ASEAN going forward. Uh, thanks, Tony. Building on the uh, intervention that my co-panelists did, I want to start with the story of uh, Tepwani, who is a housing rights activist here in Cambodia, in Phnom Penh, who is in jail because she was fighting for the housing rights of thousands of families, where the land has been now given on a 99-year lease for a tourist development. <laughs> and that is a kind of a, a emblematic case where you see the issue of economic development versus the rights of the people. So how ASEAN is going to come to terms with economic, social, cultural rights, civil and political rights of people uh, while pursuing the economic development agenda and the prosperity uh, is, I think, the key challenge that we need to be looking at. ASEAN, at this point of time, does not have an effective protection mechanism. Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about the ASEAN uh, Intergovernmental C Commission on Human Rights, the uh, Declaration of Human Rights, what it means in reality, and how some of the states are actually being able to respond to the issues that are, that are coming up. So there are a number of challenges that we need to look at while recognizing that it has come a long way. There have been progress in a number of areas, but there is still work to be done uh, for real integration where people can see the dividend of the peace and stability that Nazir talked about. 
I'd like to. ខ្ញុំចង់លើកឡើងសំណួរនេះអ្វីដើម្បីយើងអាចសម្រេចបានហើយអ្វីដែលយើងអាចអភិវឌ្ឍទៅមុខសម្រាប់ហាសិបឆ
in our region, especially within ASEAN. Secondly, I think uh, ASEAN is the fastest economic growth uh, in the region, if not in the world. Uh, we think that across ASEAN, uh, GDP growth average five uh, percent on an annual basis. And today, ASEAN ranks six in uh, six world economy. And we have manpower. ASEAN is one of the biggest eco uh, economy and one of the biggest market. We are talking about 630 million people. So this is also one of the, uh, the achievements. And more, moreover, ASEAN is a young nation. It's a young nation. The third aspect, I think ASEAN have already uplifted uh, its role in international affairs. ASEAN has 10 dialogue partners and other external partners. So with these partnership with external partners reflects how relevant, how important ASEAN has. I, I, I will see that ASEAN is it's, it's increasingly more attractive. If you look at the, 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 the structure, if you like look at the uh, ASEAN uh, meeting, we, we would have uh, most of the major power uh, in the world that are attracted to ASEAN, that are attending ASEAN summit. So I think these are uh, some of the achievements that I think uh, it's worth to, to highlight here. Of course, looking into the next 50 years, it is something that uh, we try to imagine in what would be ASEAN in the next 50 years. Um, uh, for that uh, objective, for that ultimate goal, I think ASEAN has already laid out its vision, uh, ASEAN uh, Community Vision 2025 20, and beyond. Uh, it's laid out a number of uh, uh, master plan that will bring ASEAN uh, into a more prosperous uh, in the future. But one thing I think ASEAN would uh, continue to maintain is uh, the harmony, is a community, a community that share. Sharing here, I mean, it's not only share prosperity, but we share difficulties, problems that we have, and we try to help each other to address uh, these problems. I want to go back to something, Mari, that you had just brought up, which is the fact that the ASEAN way may have been criticized quite a bit for being slow, but <coughs> it is still standing and it's still intact with its members, in uh, comparison to what's been happening in the UK with Brexit. Uh, in the wake of, of that Brexit vote, we had Indonesia's then um, trade minister, Tom Lembong, he said that I worry that within ASEAN, there is a similar danger, that ASEAN becomes a project of the elites and we don't spend enough time, money and effort socializing it to the people. So really touching upon uh, this idea that governments perhaps haven't done a good enough job in relaying the message and the benefits of globalization. I wonder, now that we are just about a year on from that Brexit vote, has the conversation changed? Has it changed in, at the business level, at the academic level, at the government level? Has there been a tangible change in the conversation to make sure that there's uh, not a repeat here? You're looking at me. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think we, ASEAN remains very cohesive. Nobody talks about ASEAN exit in the business community or any of the uh, uh, government officials that I've met. Uh, I think we all talk about how to do better with ASEAN. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think that's a, a, a testimony to the strength uh, of the organization. I think Tom was being uh, a bit dramatic there. Uh, I think that certainly more work can be done uh, to kind of enhance the ASEAN identity, to kind of sell it to the masses. Uh, but let me share with you that we just did, uh, uh, Ibu Mari was very involved in a survey uh, of youth in ASEAN. We surveyed 23,700 um, youth in ASEAN and we found that 90% are very aware of ASEAN. Two thirds say, believe that they will be better off because of ASEAN. So certainly the future generation are into 
uh, ASEAN uh, as well. And I think if you look at it, um, I actually believe you know, the Brexit vote was more about the EU being out of hand, right, rather than um, or EU getting out of hand rather than the majority of, of, of Brits not wanting to be part of Europe, right? I, actually, that's my belief. And I think, um, you know, it's very important that uh, for the rest of the world that, you know, it's read in, in its proper context uh, as well. And, he, you know, mm -hmm. long live Macron. <laughs> PJ, I wonder if you have a different view. You grew up in yes. Singapore, so you grew up in ASEAN, but you yes. now live in the UK, which was <coughs> yes. ground zero for this. Yes, well, I think you have to remember, right, the ASEAN way and its predecessor Asian values is, part, is very much part of a state-driven sort of model of uh, construction of society that emanates from post-colonialism and the need for individual ASEAN states to construct identities uh, congruent with their new national borders, right? Suddenly we have Indonesia. What on earth is an Indonesian? What on earth is a Malaysian, right? It's a very artificial construct. So we have to build these identities. And ASEAN continues to speak in that rhetoric, you know, uh, where we talk about socializing to the masses. I don't agree with that. And I don't think ASEAN is very relevant to the people. In fact, it survives because it sounds great and everyone's like, yes, it's very nice. But it's not relevant to the people of Southeast Asia. I think if you really want an ASEAN that is relevant, it has to be built from the ground up and it has to actually reflect the hopes and the aspirations of the people of Southeast Asia who see Southeast Asia very differently from the elites. And that is the part of that big problem you know, that I talked about earlier. ASEAN is a very elite-driven uh, strategy. It's an elite-driven organization. Now, with Brexit, you know, I have to agree with uh, Nazir about uh, it's the EU getting out of hand because um, the sentiment in the UK against the EU was very much driven by the insularity of the elites. Mm -hmm. I don't think many ordinary people would have phrased it exactly that way, but the fundamental reason is that in the EU, um, you have prime ministers and finance ministers going to Brussels and stitching up deals with their counterparts and then coming back to their national capitals and saying, oh, Brussels forced me to do this. You know, but I stood up for British rights and stood up for the British people in Brussels. Right? But in actual fact, they realized that the EU was a way to evade political accountability. It was a way for them to go to Brussels, get what they wanted for their country, knowing that they would never be able to actually pass it through legislation in their own country without jeopardizing their electoral position. So ASEAN, I, I think actually a lack of integration in, in ASEAN is a good thing because we want to avoid the ability for elites to insulate themselves from popular accountability from the people of ASEAN. Minister, I wonder if you were to walk out into the streets when you get home and you walked up to 10 random people in Laos and you asked them, do you know what ASEAN is? Do you know what the benefits are? What response would you get? Well, uh, when, we, when ASEAN launched uh, AEC uh, back in uh, December 31st, uh, 2015, uh, everybody was excited I mean, because uh, a high expectation that uh, ASEAN would bring, uh, ASEAN economic community would bring to the country uh, such as prosperity, uh, development, and uh, a measure to address poverty uh, uh, in the country. You know, Laos is it's one of the least developed countries. I think among ASEAN countries, probably one, Laos is one of the three countries that are still listed with countries. And we uh, working, uh, we, we partner with uh, ASEAN countries, uh, not only because uh, we are a family, but also we also have a high expectation that uh, as part of ASEAN, we would be able to, uh, to have access to uh, development cooperation and so on and so on. Uh, the government is doing a lot of, uh, uh, making a lot of effort in terms of uh, public awareness about uh, what is AEC, what is ASEAN community. Uh, but of course, uh, 
the, the, the knowledge, the awareness still lacking, mm -hmm. lacking among them. Um, because we are not yet uh, been able to uh, bring a, a more tangible uh, benefit, a tangible, something that we can be feel uh, uh, broadly among uh, the, 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 the local people, I mean the community on the grassroots level. So I think this is something that, that ASEAN uh, would, would, would have to, to address uh, in the next uh, 10 or 15 years down the road. Um, ASEAN uh, has to, to make sure that in order to implement its master plan on connectivity, its uh, ASEAN community uh, building uh, over the next 50 years, it has to be uh, uh, based on the principle of inclusiveness. It's not only uh, the government-driven uh, uh, effort, it has to be, to be participated in uh, by all uh, sectors of uh, society in the countries. Mm -hmm. so, so this is something that, I mean, ASEAN are still discussing and how, how to, to, to pursue this objective. I want to talk about the fourth industrial revolution. It's the big buzzword, I think, wherever you go, and it has been for quite a lot, uh, while now. But unlike industrial revolutions of the past, there is a very realistic possibility that it will lead to a lot of job losses. Um, and there's been this belief for a while that it would perhaps affect the developed countries first because of the low labor costs in developing countries. But that is proving not to be the case, and it's actually coming a lot quicker than I think a lot of people uh, realize. Nazir, you were talking about this, this window of opportunity. How does ASEAN make sure that they don't squander the opportunity to really grab hold of the fourth industrial revolution and exploit it for all that it's worth? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the age of acceleration. It's going to happen um, uh, almost as fast in the developing world uh, as the developed world. But I think if you take the age of acceleration plus the concerns about inequality plus the rise of neopopulism, all that added together suggests that actually what is emerging is this new world order. We just can't quite figure out what it's all going to look like. I think that companies, uh, for instance, will have to change their priorities. I think the old focus on you know, shareholder value is going to change dramatically. I think we need to certainly pay more attention to all stakeholders and certainly contribute more to societies that we live in. Um, I keep harking on uh, the India example where there's you know, legislation for, for contribution to corporate responsibility, for instance. Uh, and then those kind of uh, changes uh, need to, uh, to come into play. But overall, you know, I stand by this uh, 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 imperative that ASEAN sees this, this, this very real revolution uh, and takes uh, and responds by accelerating its uh, uh, integration. Uh, Minar, I'd like to bring you into this. Uh, the International Labour Organization uh, estimates that 56% of all salaried employment in Cambodia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand and Vietnam is at risk of displacement due to technology in the, just the next couple uh, of decades. A lot of these workers could be garment workers, which traditionally women do a lot of this work. Yes. How do we make sure that women during this fourth industrial revolution do not fall through the cracks? Yeah, and that's where the, I think the issue of how do we look at the socioeconomic rights of the people, especially the marginalized, the women, the youth. Nazir talked about the aspiration of the youth, that aspiration is always a double-edged sword. You have, if the aspirations don't get fulfilled, you'll have uh, you know, uh, social unrest. So how do we really look at those uh, ensuring that those who feel left out of the present way of doing business and the present way of organizing our economies, how they feel part and how they actually benefit from the prosperity, even of the present stage of development. And the, it will be accelerated in the way the technology is evolving. So it's not going to be another 50 years for ASEAN, maybe another five years you'll have to review whether the institutions and the mechanisms that are put in place for protection, social protection, for political um, and economic rights protection, whether all those mechanisms are actually relevant uh, and agile enough for uh, people to be protected against the onslaught of some of the changes that, that are 
coming. They're, they're not going to be late. They're not going to be delayed. And that will cause some of those issues of people losing their livelihoods, people losing access to uh, jobs, people losing access to the particular type of skill sets will no more be valued. So how do we deal with those? Because you have a large uh, population, more than 50% of ASEAN is youth, youth, young people, who will be in the job market, who are already in the job market. So how do we seek their aspirations and fulfill those aspirations and create those institutions will be quite a critical uh, way to go forward. And part of this is the fact that no sector is safe when it yeah. comes to uh, artificial intelligence and robotics. Yeah. Uh, you, you've seen in the past few years that robots can do just as good of a job, if not better a job, than doctors, mm -hmm. lawyers, uh, insurance claim adjusters, yeah. and I have to say, even journalists. So there is going to need to be a re-education, a reskilling on a yeah, mass, right. mass scale. Is ASEAN prepared for that? Do they have the educators who are going to be the ones that are going to be educating for this reskilling? Are they being educated now to be ready to start educating the next line of individuals? Well, I think that's the big challenge, of, of course, because I think everybody's kind of like scared at the moment, you know, where is this going to go? And we're, we're all kind of frozen because we, we feel that this is all going to happen very soon. So I, I think we have to take charge and, and really address. I, I do think the, the key is the human capital issue. You know, how do we make sure that uh, uh, the people in our countries are going to be ready for the change? Because what's going to go first are obviously the routine jobs. Yeah. Uh, and how do you reskill the, uh, the people uh, to be able to, to, uh, to switch and to become probably more self-employed rather than being working for people? Yeah? Uh, and I, I think uh, just computer literacy to begin with is the first step, you know, learning how to use the internet. But knowing how to get, not, not just to use it for social media or to post your pictures or to make friends with Facebook, but how do you actually get economic value out of it? And, and this, is, this is actually a, a very key part of the inclusiveness agenda, I think, because I have seen many, many examples where SMEs or even farmers who work during the day and at night they're actually designing logos and selling to the world market. These are actual examples that are happening all over. Uh, but we need to focus on First of all, physical connectivity uh, at, at a low cost and at a fast enough space, pace so that they can actually be part of it. And once they're part of it, how do they actually utilize it to improve their economic li livelihood or even self-teach, self-learn? Mm -hmm. Like this farmer example that I'm giving you, they taught themselves how to design logo and they were able to increase their income by 10 times because of that. You know, these are examples where if we could actually scale it up, uh, that would be the key. And, Obviously, the education system, the educators, uh, there's a whole uh, online learning out there that we need to probably work, maybe cooperate within ASEAN. And then you, then you, then you have to talk about standards, I think, because once you know, the whole world is changing in the way you produce goods and services. Let's not forget services. The future is actually in mm -hmm. services. And the way you deliver goods and services. So you can have a doctor somewhere in India. Uh, you, uh, telemedicine. Te telemedicine is, is already happening. Remote, they call it remote intelligence. So the know-how can stay wherever it is, but it can be transported in so many ways now. And we need to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Well, if I can be honest, uh, this discussion is very technocratic. And we all saw this uh, photo of the Trump White House where you had a dozen men signing legislation uh, on women's reproductive rights, and we laughed. But here in Southeast Asia, we have all these governments signing legislation on worker rights and not a single genuine worker representative among them. Labor does not have a genuine seat at the policy-making table in Southeast Asia. Right? And as a result, the whole issue of uh, our economic future is being treated very much as an elite issue, as a technocratic issue, without taking into account the lived reality of workers. Now, the only way for us to actually deliver on this rhetoric of inclusiveness is actually to uh, have um, greater political liber liberalization, right? free and fair elections, the ability of people to genuinely elect uh, their representatives who can then go to uh, parliament and make legislation that genuinely represents the people. And without that, I don't see how we could deliver on all these great things we're talking about. Yeah, I, TP, this, uh, I just have to respond to your colorful views that match your colorful socks. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, <laughs> you know, I think 
if I was uh, Filipino or I was Indonesian, I, I kind of say, look, we've got a furniture maker that's president, mm -hmm. but a completely <clears throat> overhauled system, right, from the Suharto era to what it is today. It's a very democratic system. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at Philippines today, right, mm -hmm. Duterte versus, you know, what they had. So I don't agree that ASEAN has been protecting elites. I think elites try to protect themselves in every country. Mm. Uh, and I don't think ASEAN gets in the way. Uh, there's been revolutions in, in various parts of ASEAN. Uh, and I think, you know, um, in terms of uh, going forwards, I think different countries have engaged. Um, uh, uh, the workers, etc. there has been, um, try of course, you know, we can say, we can pick many countries uh, led by Singapore where we think there should be, you know, greater political uh, liberalisation. Yeah, but I don't think you can generalise and say, you know, ASEAN's got in the way of political liberalization. Now, Nazir, I, I want to take a little bit of issue on that because uh, if you look at in the region, the uh, issue of, uh, you know, freedoms and human rights, there's a lot of regression that one, one sees in almost every ASEAN member state. And uh, if you look at that and if you don't see that as part of building inclusive societies, because for me, inclusion is participation and accountability. If we have uh, rulers and the states which are not accountable, which uh, enjoy impunity, number of, number of violations, then are we really moving in the right direction? And we are talking about protecting the freedoms of citizens of the ASEAN states. We are not talking about protecting somebody else's, uh, else's uh, freedoms. So yeah, I'm just yeah. trying to be a little more uh, yeah, getting the response in terms of the mechanisms. I don't disagree there's a lot more to do, but I'm just saying if you look at Indonesia today versus Indonesia then, you're talking about the governor of Jakarta you know, uh, you're talking about, uh, I think half the governors in the past have ended up in the, in the slammer, right? Uh, if there has been tremendous political change and transition yeah. in Indonesia, and I think, mm. Ibu? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, think, I think, you know, I don't think there's an end to liberalization. I think it's a process, right? Yeah. So if you compare Indonesia 20 years ago, it's so different today. Of course, we still have a, a ways to go, but, you know, I think we're moving in the right direction. I mean, can you imagine in 1996, we can't even say the word corruption openly? I can remember 96 because that's the, the first time we were able to say corruption openly, publicly, and that's like 20 years ago, right? So how much we have progressed. Uh, but I think we should not underestimate the, the role of advocacy from, you know, you, know, you say they're not represented. Uh, maybe formally they're not represented, but believe me, the advocacy that comes because of openness of information is a real presence uh, mm -hmm. in all our countries, yeah? Even in China, you know, my friends in China said, well, maybe we don't have a vote, but we do have a voice. So the, the activity that happens in, in, in because we, are, we have digital connectivity is, I think, a very important check and balance that, that can, can work uh, positively. It can also work negatively, by the way, but uh, let, let's try to take the positive aspect of it. I, I think that that would lead quite nicely into talking about, I mean, is, is social media the equalizer when it comes to this? You look to the United States, Donald Trump is the president Twitter. of Twitter, 140 <laughs> characters or less. And, it gets traction, and in a way, it spoke to people in a way that they'd never been spoken to before. Here, perhaps it's used a little bit differently, where the people on the ground are able to have their voices heard internationally. Does that change the way that governments are going to be structured in ASEAN going forward, and does that also change the way that integration will take place? Minister? Oh, well, uh, technology, of course, has an impact on, on everything when it's come to uh, to a, a, a technology. Well, ASEAN is, is, is trying to promote how uh, the structures would be effective and efficient for um, community building uh, uh, as ASEAN as a whole. Uh, I think um, ASEAN is trying, I mean, individual countries of ASEAN is trying to, to, uh, uh, to improve how the structures, uh, both at the uh, national level and uh, within ASEAN, can be improved uh, in, in, in the coming years. Um, but I think uh, um, as we go now, uh, as far as uh, ASEAN structures is concerned, I think uh, we are on the right track, on the right track. Um, yes. Our uh, distinguished panelists mentions uh, and advocate the ASEAN way. I think this is 
uh, something that we would uh, continue to pursue in maybe uh, more years to come. And uh, we haven't had yet make an assessment on whether ASEAN way is bad or good or the other way around. There is, they, they, there is not yet an alternative to, to ASEAN way. I think ASEAN ways over the past 50 years has served how ASEAN come today, how ASEAN come today. So uh, there is no point that ASEAN way would, would continue to, to, to be pursued. And this is how we, we do. Uh, this is how Asia, um, it, it, it might be uh, different from, from others. And of course, some people claim that this, it would, uh, would hinder the progress of ASEAN. But I don't believe that that would be the case because uh, uh, this is how, how, how we do and, and we would uh, continue to pursue that. We have just about 15 minutes left in the discussion. I'd like to open it up to anybody that may have questions from the audience. No? All right, then we shall continue. I want to talk about trade. Yes, there's there's one there. There. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Oh, there's a young lady. Oh, oh. oh Annie. <laughs> Thank you very much. Annie Cole, Singapore Management University. I think for the last one and a half days, uh, many of the panels and the discussions have centered about uh, lifelong learning and whether there is an ASEAN strategy behind you know, the disruptions that's taking place. We are all very bullish and very optimistic about the future of ASEAN and all the job creation that is to come. But what are we doing as a community for the disruption and how do we come together to think of a strategy in order to uh, take the displaced talent and then upgrade them for the new jobs and the new careers within the region? Thank you. This is something that Singapore, and he's from Singapore, has done quite well, this reskilling and this retraining. And they have the educational systems in place. They also have very high per capita income. So it's much easier for people to uh, be reskilled to a certain extent. Is, is there a cohesive, though, uh, plan across the region? I, I, don't, I haven't heard any, any plans on the ASEAN front, but maybe the minister can, can jump in. But I, I do think that's a very important uh, area where you can actually, you know, whatever, say, Singapore has been able to achieve uh, could be shared, right, uh, between the ASEAN countries and what somebody, some other country has come up with could also be shared because you can replicate easily, right? But, so I think the, the cooperation needs to happen to identify where, where are, what are the reskilling issues? What, what are the issues? What are the skills that are in need of reskilling? And then focus on sharing sharing whatever training programs or uh, you know, uh, replicating, replicating, scaling up. And you can do so much online mm. these days. And for a country like Indonesia, which is an archipelago, uh, it, it's online learning makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, but, ha but then you ha ask the question about the content, right? The content becomes uh, so important. So I, I believe that's a very uh, good suggestion. It's a very important area for, for ASEAN cooperation. And it will then, obviously create your community. If people are learning it from each other, uh, you are creating the ASEAN community and people can be working together and the standards and the skills would actually then converge. I want to talk about trade just very quickly before oh. we go into our closing uh, part of the discussion uh, because trade within ASEAN is, is relatively low when you compare it to other economic blocks. It's been pretty stagnant around 20, 24 percent uh, for a while now. You compare that to the EU, which is 60 percent. What do the economies within ASEAN need to do to further diversify so they're not uh, competitors in the future? Uh, they're not competing with each other. They're more complementary because I think of products like rice. There's so many ASEAN nations that are big rice producers and, and they are big exporters. How do the economies, does it need to be something that comes from a, a top-down approach where economies are told, let's try to make a strategy so you focus on one particular area, we focus on other, but still being able to maintain diversity within their individual economies? Mm. Nazir? I, sorry. Oh, sorry. So this. Oh, no, just just a few, 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 few words. I think uh, this is something that I mean, ASEAN leaders uh, have a, a big concern because we're always talking about dialogue partner, external partners, uh, enhancing cooperation and trade. 
uh, with other partners. But at the same time, we re uh, really very little talking about inter-trade among ASEAN countries. I just give an example. Just uh, a couple of days ago, my prime minister visited uh, Malaysia. Malaysia is, 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 is the fourth uh, biggest investor in Laos, FDI. But in terms of trade, it's less than one million US dollar. So this is one, one of, of example that uh, ASEAN uh, leaders are uh, having concern and try to discuss, try to, to put uh, uh, a plan and measures how we can, can uh, promote intra-ASEAN trade. We are talking about uh, big market, six, 630 million market. So uh, this is something that uh, we would, uh, of course, encourage uh, private sector, uh, business community to really help the government to, to, to address this and I'd try to uh, diversify uh, uh, trade goods that are complemented to each other. Well, I would just add that I think the trade numbers can go up uh, if we, without doing anything dramatic, if we look at the non-trade barriers. Right. I think the Malaysian Prime Minister pointed out uh, recently that uh, in the past 15 years, tariffs have, got, have been halved on average, right? Whereas non-tariff barriers have gone from 1,600 to 5,970. Yeah. Um, so that's one issue. So clearly there's a correlation, you know, yeah, 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 bring down tariffs, but let's, let's kind of cover it with non-tariff barriers. Um, so that needs to be addressed uh, at the ASEAN level. Uh, I think two is uh, information. I think, you know, I still hear from a lot of companies that they don't quite realize uh, that suppliers can come from within ASEAN uh, and what are the superior terms they can get uh, within ASEAN. Uh, and then three is uh, looking at um, areas of collaboration. I mean, there's always this argument, if you look at the huge advantage uh, and, and progress that Thailand has made in the car industry, for instance, right? Um, surely there's logic to say that, you know, we should converge uh, into Thailand as in Rayong as the sort of uh, area for specialization in, in, in automotive. Can I, can I just add to that? Uh, uh, I'll just add two very brief points. I think uh, e-commerce could also be another uh, avenue where you can have intra-ASEAN trade increase. But for that to happen, uh, I mean, the last two days what we've been hearing is that it's not enough to have the low tariffs. If you, if with e-commerce, there's a lot of facilitation issues and a uh, payment system, you know, because uh, the underlying uh, payment system and the connectivity and the technology has to be there. Uh, the second issue I would make is just because I was formerly also the tourism minister, uh, intra-ASEAN tourism flows is actually 46%, right? So if you take uh, trade in services, actually I think there's a lot more potential compared to goods. And that's because the visa, finally uh, in 2013, I think Burma was, uh, Myanmar was the last one to come in not requiring visa for uh, ASEAN nationals to travel between each other. And again, if we, going back to As ASEAN Youth Survey, you'll find that actually a lot of young people know about each other's countries quite a lot because they do travel. You know, the, the low-cost airline, that's another, I think, um, uh, advantage of what happened with ASEAN. The low-cost budget airlines are making travel uh, so much more easier. So, you know, that, that's another component perhaps that we don't talk about as much. We just have about eight minutes left, so I think that we should try to bookend the conversation um, just a little bit. I'd like to get your thoughts about what ASEAN will look like in 50 years and perhaps what a new ASEAN way would be looking like in 50 years from now. I know it's very hard to look into those crystal balls, so we're going to try. I can just go can down go the line. This way? I'll go this way. Sure. Minister, would you like to start? Well, a big challenge for me to answer this question <laughs> because. Uh, it's uh, ASEAN way would, would, would continue to be to be uh, uh, a method of, of working uh, among among ASEAN. But of course, uh, I, I would remain uh, in, in in my position in my view that ASEAN in the next 50 years would be an ASEAN uh, that shares ASEAN that care each other that would uh, bring a prosperity to all ASEAN country. Well, I, I would hope that ASEAN will still be ASEAN in, in, in another 50 years because I think, you know, while we criticize how slow it is and how much it's not addressing new challenges, 
you know, what, for whatever reason, it's, it's there. And, it, and we, we'll miss it if it's not there. Uh, and I, I think it's very important for us to, to retain and maintain ASEAN. And I think in 50 years, I would hope that ASEAN would be still uh, the central part of the East Asia configuration, where we have by then hopefully been able to have economic integration happen uh, with uh, our six main dialogue partners and maybe even wider. Who knows? We have open regionalism. Who knows? The US uh, will also join <laughs> us <laughs> from across the Pacific. We have open regionalism. And uh, it would uh, move forward in addressing uh, the new challenges uh, ahead. And you know, people would really feel like an ASEAN community. I, I do feel there is already a very strong sense uh, of ASEAN community now. Uh, even even within the young people, that was a heartening result of the um, youth survey, uh, and we need. I think we can do more. Uh, and the digit, let's not be scared about the digital revolution and the fourth industrial revolution, but look at it as an opportunity. For me, uh, ASEAN is a unique opportunity because in Asia there is no other block which is as structured as ASEAN. Uh, so there's a way forward for ASEAN to really build strong protection mechanisms to really ensure that the human rights of all people are, are ensured. The second point, I think there is a, there is a kind of a, a misnomer as if the human rights are civil, political, economic, social rights are a hindrance to economic development. No, they are actually building blocks to more inclusive and sustainable human development. So if you put it from that perspective, I think that change is quite, quite important in perspectives to be had by the ASEAN leaders. Then ASEAN will become a strong, uh, really people-driven, uh, you know, fulfilling people's aspiration kind of a block and be a model for other sub-regional blocks in the Asia Pacific. PJ? Well, I am very skeptical of ASEAN, as you know, and I think, um, I don't think it will be very relevant in 50 years. Uh, if it exists, if it continues to exist, I don't want it to uh, proceed very far beyond what it is today. Because quite frankly, an ASEAN with the ability to impose human rights um, on the member states of Southeast Asia is also in a position to impose some very, very bad things on the people of Southeast Asia. I think the people of Southeast Asia need to fight for human rights uh, in their own countries at the level of sovereignty, at the level where they are genuinely representative. So I, I always tell my students, you know, don't, it's a common uh, human flaw uh, to extrapolate from the present and assume that the present will never change. But if you look at ASEAN's past 50 years, there's been dramatic changes. Uh, borders have changed very significantly around the world. So I think ASEAN, if it still exists, uh, it, it it won't reflect anything that, um, it, it won't be very much like what it is today. Um, and I think the best thing for it actually is not to um, get any more powerful, not to integrate any further, but to stay as a talking shop. <laughs> Can you invite me as a guest lecturer to your class? <laughs> anytime, anytime. <laughs> When I look at uh, ASEAN in 50 years, I think where I am today, I am enthusiastic but pessimistic. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I look at the Blueprint 2025, um, I look at what happened with uh, the ASEAN Charter 2007, I'm pessimistic because there isn't a change in the execution plan. In fact, there's no real execution plan. It's sort of business as usual, the, the old ASEAN way. And I really think that we need to change the ASEAN way. And what does that mean? I think central to execution is a body that's going to follow through with execution. Today, most projects are done in committees of 10, right? and nothing gets done. And if you look at the details of many of the exec uh, uh, in integration exercises, if you look at the banking master plan, for instance, there was too much focus on how many licenses one country gives to another, and missing the real point that value is created uh, in areas like back office outsourcing for banks, uh, like uh, uh, ease of movement of skilled labor, like flow of, 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 of data and so on and so forth. So um, I really think that we're missing a lot in execution. So uh, my strong view is that uh, we should put together a plan to enlarge, to, um, uh, to give more funding, uh, to make the ASEAN Secretariat more effective, yeah. whilst at the same time still respecting uh, the, 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 the strong traits of the ASEAN way that has kept us uh, together all this while. 
So clearly a lot of mixed views uh, when it comes to in ASEAN challenges that lie ahead, but I think overwhelmingly uh, the people that I speak with are very optimistic about uh, the future here. When you look at the demographics, you look at the economics, uh, there's a lot of things uh, certainly going in its favor. That's going to do it for our panel discussion this afternoon. But if, if you don't mind, if you could all just please remain in the room, because we're going to be uh, having the closing plenary uh, happening right after this discussion. So please don't go anywhere. Thank you very much.